I'm not quite used to this, but how it goes. All right, so uh, as you can see on your program, the title of this presentation is Ariadne of Naxos, a study of transformation through contrast and unity. First of all, let's take a look at the compositional background of Ariadne of Naxos. Ariadne of Naxos is written by a German composer Richard Strauss with a libretto by Hugo von Hofmannsthal. It was originally composed as a divertissement for Hofmannsthal's adaptation of Moliere's play Le Bourgeois Jean de Lyon. The premiere of the opera in 1912 was unsuccessful because the audience who were more interested in the opera had to wait for the play to end. The play and the opera together was six hours. In life. Obviously, a huge demand on the audience. <coughs> the play going public had no interest in the opera, and the opera goers did not wish to see the play. <laughs> the first version of Ariane was quite lengthy and required a significant number of actors aside from the vocalists, which made it really expensive to produce. Hoffmannstadt proposed that Strauss write a second version with a prologue explaining why commedia, commedia dell'arte elements are introduced into the tragedy of Ariadne, which is what happens. It's very bizarre. The second version of the opera premiered in 1916 in Vienna. And although the second version was not received with enthusiasm at the time, it remains to be the version performed today and will be the focus of this presentation. Ariadne of Naxos is a masterpiece that builds on contrast to achieve a greater unity, which was the British Hoffman style's favorite technique. Ariadne is an opera within an opera. It provides a setting in which a tragedy and a comedy are performed at the same time, leading to a variety of conflicts. Originally, Hoffman style intended to focus the opera on the classical heroine Ariadne, the tragic and noble character, but Strauss turned it around and focused on Tepaneta instead. <laughs> because a more interesting character. Strauss's early sketches of Ariadne show that he greatly favored the coloratura soprano because all the numbers that involved Tepanetta were laid out in detail whilst others were only briefly described. Strauss even considered the possibilities of coloratura sopranos at the time who would be suited to sing the role of Tepanetta. By putting a spotlight on Tepanetta, Strauss fully exploits the potential of comedic writing and pokes fun at not only operatic traditions, but also the execution of dramatic elements in operas, while also providing insight into the performer's perspectives. The prologue, the opera is divided into two main sections, the prologue and the opera, Ariane of Naxos. Um, the prologue was composed for the second version of the opera. It was not in the first version. Two performing groups, an opera company and a Commedia dell'arte troupe arrive at the house of the richest man in Vienna to provide an evening's entertainment. The two groups show their disdain for each other's art, claiming themselves to be superior. To their shocking discovery, shortly before the performances, the rich man has requested for the comedy and the tragedy to perform at the same time so that the fireworks can start at 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> the prologue serves an important function. First of all, it marks the theme of the opera, the meaning of two contrasting musical forms. By setting the scene at the rich man's house with bizarre requests concerning the form of the performances, Strauss and Hoffmannsthal created a platform for the exchange of two starkly different styles of music. On the other hand, the setting reflects on real life production difficulties in an exaggerated manner. It provokes the audience to think from the producers and the performers' perspectives and highlights the conflicts between the opera company and Commedia dell'arte group with the climax being the duet between the composer and Zeminetta which would be the first performance excerpt of this recital. This is the first point of unity between the ide idealist and the comedian as they reach an understanding. The composer, a pants role played by a woman, is the young man who takes his music extremely seriously. 
He talks about deep subjects of humanity, such as the suffering and glory of a noble woman waiting for her one true love, and dismisses any sort of comic entertainment as he believes them to contain little substance and that they are performed solely to get a good laugh out of the audience. He also finds performance of comic characters to be quite shallow and that they are incapable of understanding the great sufferings of humanity. Upon the news of having to perform with Sabinetti's troupe, at the same time, he mourns the ruination of his great music. Any addition of comic relief in his opera, he considers a catastrophe because it belittles his work. Sabinetti's troupe, on the other hand, responds to the situation quite well. After all, improvisation is their trade, and they're used to adapting to all kinds of circumstances. They immediately come up with plots and possibilities of instigating themselves into the show. The layout of the characters is exceptionally clever. The contrast is double-sided. It not only exists among the two performing groups, but also between the composer and Sabinetta themselves. The composer is a serious figure, but he takes himself so seriously that he becomes a caricature. Sabinetta seems to be a mere flirt, but she reveals insights into womanhood that the composer greatly values. In the early portions of the duet between the composer and Sabinetta, the composer dwells on his operatic heroine Ariadne. She is such a noble lady that if she does not find her lover, she will face the only option of death. The composer's melodies are lyric, lush, declamatory with long phrases. Sabinetta's vocal lines are, in contrary, chirpy and segmented. Often, when she interrupts the composer, there is a sudden meter change, which makes the contrast between the two even stronger. She tried to snap the composer out of his self-pitying world and see more possibilities in life instead of wallowing in his emotions. If you have the handout, um, example one shows the pattern, their vocal patterns. I guess I didn't print on. Um, most of the composer's phrases are three measures long and sang expressively in full form. Well, in measure number 10, Sabinetta chirps in the high range and in the dance-like meter of 6-8. The conflict between the composer and Sabinetta continues until Sabinetta assures the composer that he will survive, referring to the performing situation and the perseverance of his art. The composer, curious, asks her what she really means. Sabinetta then breaks into a lyric musical moment, a short soliloquy starting from the words, I'm all good link, a moment. She reveals that she is playing the role of a coquette but the audience does not know what her heart really yearns for, or what she really is as a person. This part of Sabinetta's music is similar to that of the composer's, illustrating musically that Sabinetta really understands the composer's insights of humanity in the bottom of her heart, that she in truth shares the same sentiments of the composer, and yet it is hard for others to tell because of the comic roles she usually plays. Example two is an excerpt of Tebinetta's lyric section. Uh, it starts with I often look, and the structure of her vocal lines here resemble that of the composer's, suggesting that she is speaking of more profound emotions. This is a wonderful point of unity between the two worlds the serious and the farcical, both in terms of music and character. Musically, Sabinetta has taken up the composer's singing style, exchanging melodies with him in harmony. They are singing to each other. And because we now learn that Sabinetta is capable of deep thoughts, she has been brought into the composer's world, and the composer falls in love with her. In other words, by introducing multiple contrasts, Strauss and Hoffman style managed to unite the two entities by adding complexity to Tebinetta's character and making fun of the series composer supported by musical devices. 
at this point, we're going to burst into music. So, uh, this is the duet by, uh, in the prologue with the composer sung by Katie Bieber, mezzo soprano, and Ji Wan Choi.
they sing together starting from measure one in a chord. And by measure four, Nayada starts a vocal sequence that's followed by uh, Driade and so on. The nymphs begin the opera by singing about the sleeping Ariadne in the pastoral 6-8 meter that blooms in the metasmetic sections. Meanwhile, Ariadne's melodies resemble those of the composer, but in an even more elaborate manner. The melodies seem to be supported by harmonies that go on and on without reaching a true resolution, just like a Wagnerian und endlich melody. It begins in E-flat major, uh, this is in example four. From Anschönes, it begins in E flat major, modulates through a number of different keys momentarily, and by measure nine, it comes back to the key of E flat. But it doesn't end there because the text ends at Tesius Ariadne in bar 13. There, the harmony stops at the dominant of E flat major at the end of the phrase, calling for yet another resolution. Just like any heroine in Wagnerian operas, Ariadne's lament is extensive. Sepinetta and company make their first entrance at Ariadne's mention of death, und eine Tote sein. As bizarre as the situation may seem that a burlesque troupe is making an appearance in the middle of a Wagnerian lament. Their function is to cheer up Ariadne and pre prevent her from killing herself. Hollywood sings his aria, Lieben Hassan, but Ariadne is unmoved. She resumes her lament. Soon after, the four clowns, Brigella, Scaramucho, Turpadin, and Hollywood make their big ensemble entrance. The meter changes from Ariadne's full four to a joyful two four. They proclaim that, although they respect Ariadne's great love for Theseus, they do not approve of a doleful attitude and encourage Ariadne to cheer up by singing and dancing. Sabinetta joins in and soars high above in her vocal line, displaying her virtuosity in the high range. The ensemble sings at length about singing and dancing, and then the company leaves Sabinetta alone with Ariadne to sing the famous number, Holmes Magdiga Princess. Grossmachtige Prinzessin is one of the most virtuosic coloratura arias in operatic history. It demands a tremendous amount of stamina and varied stylistic interpretations. Above all, since Zepinetta is the central character of the opera, she is the embodiment of the main theme, which is fully displayed in the aria. She becomes transformed in several ways. Zepinetta's aria is a 12-minute soliloquy. <coughs> The aria contains rich musical and contextual elements that divide into several sections. In this aria, one witnesses the transformation of Tepinetta from a coquette into something more substantial. A woman who expresses her longing for one true love and yet succumbs to her whims of new exciting romance, representing the deeper yearnings of humanity. The musical analysis of this aria is mostly based on the work of Norman Delmont. To begin to understand the structure of this epic aria, it is essential to be acquainted with the libretto of Zepinetta's Salut, which is basically an essay on love. Zepinetta's aria can be divided into four main sections, recitative, arietta, arietta, and rondo. The first section is characterized by the alternation between rapid, speech-like patterns and more legato phrases. <coughs> this is the first part of the recitative section of Tepinetta's aria. She says to Ariane, High and mighty princess, who wouldn't understand that for such noble and lofty persons, sadness must with another standard be measured than for ordinary mortals. And yet, are we not both women? And does there not be in each breast an inexplicable heart? To speak of our weakness, to admit it to ourselves, is it not painfully sweet? And do our senses not throw from it? You do not wish to hear me, beautiful and proud and motionless, as though you were the statue on your own tomb. 
Do you want to have no other confidant than this rock and these waves? Princess, listen to me. Not for you alone. All of us, for all of us, that which numbs the heart. Who is the woman who has not suffered through it? Zebinetta starts by addressing Ariadne's grief. Somewhat sarcastically assuring her that a noble princess's grief is surely deeper than that of a common. Then she proceeds to establish a connection with Ariadne by drawing on womanhood. Every woman in this world has experienced heartbreak owing to the change of heart in men, but are women not guilty of yearning of new love, new love as well? The section, this section of this aria is marked by varying accompaniment and textures. First of all, the piano is the sole accompaniment until the 11th bar when the strings enter. Despite the inclusion of other instruments, the piano remains the principal accompanist of Tebinetta until the next arietta section, reminiscent of Strauss's Lida. The texture of the accompaniment adapts accordingly to the text, mostly written in a simple portal form to support the flow of the libretto until Tebinetta speaks of a thrill, the yearning for excitement and love for adventures. Here, the accompaniment suddenly moves in fast arpeggios to illustrate the word zin, shifting quickly to respond to the context. Uh, that is shown in example five. It explains itself. Seeing that Ariadne is unmoved, Sabinetta carries on to defy heartless men who leave women brokenhearted, while also admitting that women change their hearts as well as men. She says, Forsaken, in despair, rejected. Ah, such desolate islands are countless even among men. <coughs> I myself have inhabited many of them and have not learned to curse men. Faithless they are that, monstrous without limits. <coughs> a brief night, a passionate day, a flutter of the breeze, a fleeting glance transforms their hearts. But are we protected against the cruel delightful, incredible transformations. In this ending session of the recitative, the pace begins to pick up. Strauss once again uses rapid arpeggios as an accompaniment for a brief night all the way until it transforms their hearts as a motive for the whims of a new romance. This section ends with a most unpredictable vocal line on the word fervado, twisting and turning from a high B flat dipping down to a D flat below the staff and stops in the key of F, preparing our ears for the D flat major that is to come. Up to this point, Sabinetta is still acting like how her character is usually seen by others. She's funny, cheerful, and she points out how women are just as fickle as men. She has not yet gone through any transformation. She is simply establishing her character's identity. At the end of the recitative section, Ariadne is no longer interested in listening to Tabinata's singing and has left the stage. The, Ar the Ariadne section then begins with Tabinata singing to the audience alone. She says, Yet when I believe myself belonging to one man and think myself to be so trustworthy, there mingle in my heart gently infatuating feelings of a never tasted freedom of affording love, wandering and shameless. So am I sincere and yet deceptive. I consider myself true, but I am quite bad. <laughs> With false importance, everything is weight, and half knowing what I'm doing and half in ecstasy, I betray him in the end and yet really love him. She talks of how she really believes that she is true to one lover, but the end betray in the end betrays him and yet still loves him. Her melodies once again recall the vocal style of I'm Alvin Blick, as you have heard in the duet in the prologue. She is revealing to the audience that she wishes to be true to one lover just like Ariadne. The Ariadne takes up the form of a gentle free form movement in D flat, full of Strauss's favorite harmonic side slips. One of the best examples of such side slips is uh, if you would refer to example six, is at the first betrug ich in endlich, which is the second system, uh, 
um, that would be the two of the bedroom. Um, it rises from it rises a half step from G sharp to A in the vocal line, transitions chromatically, going and going through F major once again at the second betrug, at the end of the second system, and finds it w its way back to D flat major. The key that this arietta section originated when Sabinetta was speaking of being true to one lover. This is one of the many places in the opera where Strauss displays his superior technique of fusing text and harmony together. The changes in the texture and key of the harmony are so tightly tied with the libretto that realization of Sabinetta's emotion becomes extremely effective. The audience gets to see interchangeable heart signified by the shifting harmony, while also understanding that she really would like to be true to one lover, which is brought out by the return to D flat major. The next section is also in the form of an arietta in a significantly different style. Sabinetta starts to name a few lovers that she has had, speaks of how she sometimes even loves two of them at once. She claims that it is never a whim, but a necessity. It is what her heart yearns for, and it is not something that she can even understand herself, she says. So it was with Pagliazzo and Mezzetti. Then it was with Cavicchio, then Morati, then Pasquariello. Once in a while, it seemed to me that there were two, but never whims, always a necessity, always a new anxious amazement that a heart cannot even understand itself. Although this section marks an important shift in Sabinetta's mood and thoughts, it's actually quite short. The function of the section is mostly to quicken the aria's pace, leading to the extensive coloratura sections in the rondo that follows. It will never end. Sabinetta talks about her romantic encounters with five commedia dell'arte figures in the respective order of Pagliazzo, a simple clown, Buratino, a servant, Cavicchio, a peasant, Mezzatino, another servant, and Pasquariello, an elderly guardian. Each lover is characterized by a musical gesture. Pagliazzo and Cavicchio, uh, this is in example seven. It's marked clearly in the square. Pagliazzo and Cavicchio share the same rising sequence of a turn followed by triplets hinting at the colorful characters. While the gesture of Buratino and Mezzatino only consists of four notes laid out in a rather plain manner, suggesting that they might be rather boring. <laughs> Pasquariello receives a set of triplets, giving the impression of a grumpy old man of many complaints. <laughs> As Tobinetta begins to claim that moving from one lover to another is a necessity and not a whim, the music begins to soar in the coloratura. The words laune, meaning whims, and nusen, necessity, are assigned to descending triplets. And the words gazish zelba, even itself, are met with soaring scales of B flat major and D major. The section ends with a cadenza in the same key. This would be in example eight. This cadenza at the bottom of the, well, the end of the second system and the bottom system is sung and accompanied, reminiscent of a bel canto aria. In this case, however, the cadenza does not mark the end of the, of the aria, as in the bel canto, but prepares for the next round of section in which Sabinetta will dazzle the audience with an extraordinary amount of color to <laughs> Molly should have written that before I said <laughs> This unaccompanied cadenza is significant also because Sabinetta is slipping into a different perspective. She's playing with the elaboration of her ornaments, beginning at Gossage Zelda, even itself. Each syllable of a word is ornamented extensively regardless of whether a word itself deserves such importance. This is Sabinetta singing coloratura to amuse her audience but at the same time gradually become a, becoming aware that she is free to play with the music and in turn amuse herself. The fourth part of Sabinetta's aria is in the form of a rondo, with a principal theme stated a few times after the introduction of a subordinate theme. Much like the last section, the libretto is more condensed, 
and the words are repeated along with virtuosic vocal display. She says, like a god, each one came, and his step made me speechless. As he kissed my brow and cheeks, I was captivated by the god and completely changed. Like a god, each one came, each one transformed me. He kissed my mouth and cheeks, yielding, I was silent. The new god came, yielding, I was silent. Although the section is not extensive in terms of text, Sabinetta undergoes yet another transformation on many levels. The first one is obvious, which is when Sabinetta meets a new god, a new lover. Her heart is captivated by this man, and she used to him. Uh, and as she used to him, she is transformed onto something that cannot be put into words. The section of the Rondo consists of two episodes, Cadenza and Coda. The first episode of the Rondo introduces two main musical ideas, with the first being very similar to the Soren Tomatura style in the previous Arietta section, and the second one a contrasting serene lyricism. The principal theme of the Rondo is in example 9 uh, in the first system from at Auf ein Gott kam jeder gegangen. The musical phrase of Charles and God come jede gegangen represents Temenetta and is heard at the beginning of the instrumental introduction in the, in the prologue. It is one of the most important recurring principal themes in the opera. In the two episodes of the Rondo, this principal theme returns five times, each time marking the beginning of another development into the subordinate theme. The first part, cadenza, of the libretto in this section from Aus ein Gott till Um 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 is set to a dance-like rhythm with more regular phrasing and a bit of twist on the word gewandelt to illustrate change. The rondo of Aus ein Gott then returns for a second time, goes through a subordinate theme, and then ends in D major. With a brief return to the theme of Aus ein Gott, the music drifts into the second episode of the rondo, the coda, here, Tabanetta begins to improvise more freely on her vocal line. The more points out little joke that Strauss has incorporated into this section, which I think is really fun. If you look at uh, example 10, it shows the prompts from the orchestra to Tabanetta in measures one, uh, one and two, which is marked in the bracket in the score. And again, in measure five, after she sings Wanda uh, Tamir. Um, here, Delmar explains that the star singers of the 17th and early 18th century often omitted part of their vocal lines in order to re-enter with great effect in the cadenza. Strauss recreates such an instance with Sabinetta when she misses an entry, and upon hearing the orchestra's prompt, leaving the part of the instrument and coyly joins in only for a few notes. Tabinetta's competition with the orchestra becomes keener as the episode develops. She starts to sing in a trance-like manner. The flute imitates some of Tabinetta's flowery coloratura, which recalls the composing style of famous Belcondo composers such as Donizetti and Bellini. Then sounds yet another brief return of the theme of I'm Bot. As Tabinetta sings higher and higher, the orchestra also gets louder. Example 11 is an excerpt of the build-up during Sabinetta's fight with the orchestra. In order to compete, she holds a high D, which is what we do when we want to compete. <laughs> <laughs> In measure four, all the way to measure six. And then when it's not enough, she adds a trill on measure seven in the vain attempt of being her. <laughs> When the orchestra finally pauses at the 6th floor court at measure 9, Sabinetta bows and thanks them before continuing with her cadenza. <laughs> I would not do that by <laughs> Strauss satire on the struggle for attention between the orchestra and the coloratura soprano is not only amusing and revealing, but also draw, draws the audience's attention away from the role of Sabinetta and onto the soprano herself. 
to pull from the mark. Zabinetta is now purely a coloratura soprano performing on the stage in unequal competition with the orchestra, orchestra resources of the composer. At the end of the aria, the theme of Alzheimer's Gott returns for one last time. Another man enters Zabinetta's life. She yields and she's silent. <coughs> this is a puzzling ending to such an epic aria. Zabinetta has been singing about all the wonderful transformations she goes through when she meets a new man. She gets so carried away that the audience would have no choice but to believe her. But then she ends the aria with uncertainty, leading to an anticlimactic climatic, anti climatic ending. Perhaps this is part of Strauss's satire. After so much virtuosic display, a grand ending is expected, but instead, the exact opposite takes place. The audience is then left to wonder whether Tabinetta really meant all she said in the aria. Is she content with her flightness, or is she really yearning for her one true love? The beauty of the situation is that the open-ended question is probably the answer. This opera, seemingly bizarre, mirrors real-life situations from the beginning, when the two performing groups were forced to perform together. Zampinetta cannot tell the audience what her heart really longs for, because in real life, one can never predict the change of heart. To further develop this idea, Strauss writes, uh, wrote a short reprise for Zampinetta. Although she has chosen to be with the clown Harlequin, she returns alone onto the stage when Ariadne and Bacchus sing their glorious love duet. The irony is that the faithful Ariadne has ended up with another man, Bacchus, while Zabinetta is alone, singing about another lover entering her life, and that she is once again silent. This completes the role of Zabinetta as a realistic, complex character. One of the most interesting aspects of Ariadne of Naxos is the shifting perspectives in the show. Zabinetta's this has, this has much to do with transformation through contrast and unity. Through shifting perspectives, a subject, which is a narrator or audience, transforms into a different entity or it comes to another point of view. They gain a different perspective through the transformation. Unity is reached by realizing the fact that one person could simultaneously play multiple parts and that all the varying perspectives can be united as a new entity. Sabinetta's words in the duet with the composer provoke the audience to consider the performer's reflection on themselves and their performances. The audience's usual perspective of a performer is one-dimensional. The main soprano role, role in Ariadne is Sabinetta. From the performer's, performer's perspective, however, a threefold drama is taking place. The singer-actress alternately plays the three roles of the coloratura soprano, the entertainer, and the common woman. And it, and it has been covered in the last section. The soprano singing Zabinetta reveals herself while battling for attention with the orchestra. She makes fun of the vocal traditions and mocks coloratura when it becomes a pointless virtuosic display. Here, the singer-actress plays the role of a coloratura soprano. However, as the coloratura soprano begins to improvise too extensively without intention, she falls into the category of an entertainer, whose mere purpose is to provide amusement. Finally, one wonders whether the piquette is also being mocked, as well as the prima donna or Ariadne. Sabinetta <coughs> says to the composer in the duet, in the theater, I play the role of a coquette, but who says that is what my heart really is? This suggests that the singer of Tempinetta understands the silly caricature of such a flirtatious woman, and that she probably doesn't always agree with the way that Tempinetta acts or thinks. All of the above contrasting perspectives are embodied in the one role of Tempinetta forming a sense of unity. The audience is asked to shift their perspectives accordingly as well. During Tempinetta's aria, the perspective of the listener changes in the opposite direction to that of the shift during Ariane's Lament. In Ariane's Lament, she sings extensively of her great suffering for love. And as the prima donna shows great passion about what she's singing and believes she is Ariane entirely, so 
so the audience is moved to believe her as well. In this case, the singer falls into the perspectives of the role that she's playing. However, as Tabinetta goes on in her aria about love, she seems to forget what she's singing about when she bursts into excessive coloratura. The singer is amused by this and drifts away from the role of Tabinetta as she gets more and more carried away. As a result, the listeners feel in touch with the impulses of the performer and not the character of Tabinetta. In conclusion, Ariadne is not the most comedy performed opera nowadays, but it is one of Strauss's masterpiece, masterpieces with wit, a great variety of music, and intriguing philosophical ideas. The polarities and contrasts between Tepinetta and Ariadne and the composer are so cleverly matched with the effective libretto and use of musical styles and gestures. One is reminded of the duo of Strauss and Hoffmann's as they were rumored to have stark contrasts in their personalities as well. Strauss was known to be more straightforward and swift, while Hoffmannstahl was an introspective poet. Perhaps some parts of their personal attitudes have been brought into this great work and contributed to the richness of the great Ariadne of Naxos, an opera within an opera, satire upon satire. Now, let's hear the aria. <laughs>
My voice teacher, Joyce Castle, who's been my teacher for six years. Then <laughs> I've been at KU. Uh, big hand to her. to learn and it took me a really long time. I would like to give a special thanks for John Muter.